Because if you have kids, you have to love them all unconditionally. As an uncle, you pick your favorite. There you go. There you go. So I'm coming off a great Christmas. If anyone's from a big family, you might have the system we have. We don't get every sibling this, uh, a gift. We pick one name, give one sibling a gift. And it worked out perfect last winter. I picked my oldest brother. And I'll ask you, what do you think's a good present for someone who owes you money? <laughs> I got him a gift certificate to me. felt real good. I go, there you go, Mark. Remember that 400 you owe me? It's down to 380. Happy holidays. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I love the holidays, though, man. I love the Anything with the little kids, I always, I always like. Now, I've only been a father for two Christmases, but I've been an uncle for a long time. That's a sweet gig, too. That's, that's why I tell a lot of young people, I go, don't let anyone pressure you to have children. But you should pressure your siblings to make something. <laughs> Because you can't beat aunt or uncle, it's the greatest, right? Because if you have kids, you have to love them all unconditionally. As an uncle, you pick your favorite. There you go. There you go. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's the best part of Christmas. How come you didn't get a Christmas present? Because you're hard to be around. That's why you didn't get a Christmas present. No, I'm not cheap. I bought your sister a pony. Look in the backyard. I got her a pony. I didn't think you guys would get behind that one. All right. A little, you guys are a little meaner than I thought here in Utah. Right? <laughs> hey, you know what holidays really changed in my, in my lifetime? Culturally, Easter. Because my nieces and nephews, they, they open pre These kids expect presents for Easter. I go, oh, times have changed, man. When I was a kid, my father didn't even color the Easter eggs. He just bought brown eggs. <laughs> And he hit them in the same spot every year, behind the mayonnaise in the fridge. That was, he goes, you found them good, make me an omelet. Okay, I got you. I got you, Pops. I got you, Pops. My wife is Jewish, and people, I don't, you know, that's not as, yeah, it used to be a bigger deal. People don't care as much. I get this question once in a while. People go, hey, your wife's Jewish, huh? Is she real religious? I go, uh, apparently not. She married me. <laughs> in fact, I'm a better Jew than her. I married a Jew, and she can't say that. So, <laughs> And then I made two more Jews. I'm, for an Irish kid, I, I'm pretty, that's pretty impressive. He's a mediocre Catholic, now I'm a good Jew. It's pretty exciting, I gotta be honest with you. But people do tell me with, with my daughters, they go, you know, your, you know, your daughters are Jewish. I go, of course, I go, they're, they're half Jewish. They go, no, 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 they're all Jewish. I go, well, that's pretty cool. You know, when they get older, people can ask their heritage. What am I? All Jewish. Plus half Irish. It'll be great on job interviews. You need someone to give 150%, you're looking at it right here. <laughs> this is my first time here. This is a very scenic place. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. That's the snowiest city in the whole country. And uh, they don't even acknowledge it. I remember as a kid seeing an ice cream truck with a snowplow blade come down the street going, here you go. Right there. <laughs> now, I assume most people are from the Provo area, but uh, we might have some out of town guests. Uh, my advice when you travel, no matter where you go, don't tell the locals what you're doing. Because no matter what, they're like, that stuff's all touristy. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a tourist. <laughs> you want me to get a job this week? Would that make it really good? <laughs> get back to work all sunburned. People, hey, where'd you go, the Caribbean? No, I ended up roofing in Florida. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> but this is a beautiful town. I went to, up to the campus and took some photos. You got the dramatic mountains in the back. It's unbelievable. Then you ever send someone a photo that's, uh, says, cell phone cameras don't capture that. You send it to someone else, like, what are you, putt-putt golfing? Where are you? I go, no, that's the, that's the real thing right there. So good to be with you. So I'll tell about myself. I'm a married man. We have some married folks here, I'm sure, huh? Yeah. I just got married four years ago. I was a little late. I was an older, older groom. I'm glad I waited, because you know, guys in their 20s are very shallow. They just care about looks. But as you mature, you look for a soulmate with money. That's what it is. I was always hoping to meet a woman with a raspy voice. That's very attractive to men, right? When we hear a woman with a raspy voice, we think, hey, maybe she's all done yelling. Down the one. 
Anyone engaged in the room? Do we have some young love? Anyone engaged? No? I like meeting the engaged people because I feel like I have wisdom, finally, because by the time I got married, my friends were all married, and they gave me a great tip. They go, hey, when you plan the wedding, whatever you order, if the vendors find out it's for a wedding, they raise their prices. Go, oh, okay. So we were sly. We went to the bakery together. We go, hey, we need a three-layer cake with a formal couple on top for a fundraiser. <laughs> Our friends got injured ballroom dancing. <laughs> then you gotta reserve hotel rooms way in advance if you have out of town friends. So my, my wife handled that, she called up the hotel. She goes, hi, yeah, we need to reserve a dozen hotel rooms for next November of next year. And uh, we're hoping to get a discount because uh, it's for a funeral. <laughs> Things are good, things are good at home. One source of touch, I married a morning person. My wife is a relentless morning person. She'll wake me up to tell me I can keep sleeping. <laughs> uh -huh. Hey, it's six o'clock, but you can sleep till seven. <laughs> you know, I know, you told me at five. <laughs> right. Wow, what a crowd. <laughs> she, she says I sleep too much. She said, that's a sign of depression. I go, yeah, but I was happy when I was sleeping. <laughs> but neither one of us are sleeping as much anymore, but for happy reasons, because two years ago, we had a beautiful baby girl. How about that, Provo, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we named her Cheap Applause. That's my daughter's name. <laughs> Then a year ago, we had daughter number two. We named her Standing Ovation, everybody. No, no, no. <laughs> it is true. I got two beautiful girls at home. Uh, kids are great. Uh, mom's a little colicky, but the kids are doing great. <laughs> parents, by round of applause. I'm sure we got a lot of parents here. Some parents. Yeah. Congratulations. Most of you are probably way ahead of me, and you're probably going to laugh, but uh, I think it's getting, I don't want to jinx it. I feel like it's getting less difficult. I felt like the newborn stage. And my limited experience is the most challenging, but newborns are tough, right? Come home from the hospital all wiped out. Then all your friends want to come over. They're all good intentioned. They're, hey, we want to see the baby. When's the best time to see the baby? And we're like, uh, 4 a.m. would be real helpful. <laughs> right. Don't be late. We're leaving her by the door for you, so. <laughs> I love being a parent, though. There's a big perk. I wish I knew about this when I was a younger man. The coolest thing is that as soon as, soon as you have a, a child, from that moment on, you get to pretend that your opinion has more merit on every topic. <laughs> no matter what people are talking about, go, well, listen, to, hey, 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 hey. As a father <laughs> of two little girls, why would you throw a pass from the one yard line? <laughs> My wife has a real job, in case you're nervous for us. <laughs> I know, whenever a comedian says he has kids, the crowd's like, what, what do you feed them, punchlines? How's that work? <laughs> no, my wife's got a good job. I don't know what she does, but we got HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, ESPN. No, my wife's line of work is digital marketing, which I knew nothing about. I still know, I don't know much about it, right? But uh, basically, she does social media for big companies. So if you want to be Facebook friends, with your toothpaste, my wife can hook that up. <laughs> so she's got me on all the social media. I feel I'm a little old for that, but she's got me on all social media, so I'm on Twitter. But my wife's the only one that pays attention to me. So I just tweet, did you feed the dog? <laughs> Hashtag, he looks hungry. <laughs> he looks very hungry. You got a hungry looking dog. So we're from slightly different backgrounds. I grew up in upstate New York. I grew up in Syracuse, New York, like I said, uh, big family. And uh, I got three brothers, three sisters, and uh, my father's warming up to us now, which is exciting, you know? <laughs> Growing up, when we were all in the house, we drove my dad crazy, you know? He, seven kids in the house. He didn't hide it either. We used to go on those field trips in school. We give our dad the permission slip. It's got that question, in case of an emergency. My dad would write, do not resuscitate. <laughs> But 
but now he's all sentimental. So now when the whole family gets together, my father gets his camcorder out. Still got the camcorder, right? And he'll record everybody, right? And then he's so excited, he'll play the tape right then. And to be polite, we sit down to watch it. You ever been to a party where the second half of the party, you're forced to watch video of the first half of the party? <laughs> oh, this memory lane right here, Dad, boy. Those were the todays, huh? those were the todays. My father's a former Marine, any military in the room? Former military in the room by round of applause? There we go, good, good, good. Good for you, yeah. Now, if there's any Marines here, they're gonna be unhappy with how I phrase it. I say, my father's a former Marine. Marines say, there's no such thing. Once a Marine, always a Marine. And I love that sentiment, but it leads to a lot of disappointment if I tell people, uh, hey, my father's a Marine. They go, whoa, where's he stationed? I go, uh, he's stationed at a kitchen table in Syracuse, New York. <laughs> He's currently defending his crossword puzzle from my mom. <laughs> Operation, keep the pencil. <laughs> now my wife's an only child. She's from New York City, my wife, and I live in New York City now. I moved to New York City. I moved there because that city has so much energy. And then I learned the city gets its energy by sucking it out of the people that live there. <laughs> <laughs> then my friends visit me and they go, hey, what's your favorite thing to do in New York City? I go, uh, find parking. Really, that's the most exciting. <laughs> Sometimes finding a parking spot is so exciting, I pull out and look for another one to get that rush again. You know, I gotta do this. It's like my catch and release. So my wife's from New York City and she's an only child. So early in our courtship, she was very interested in the logistics of a large family. And she would ask me, she'd go, all right, when your whole family gets together, who cooks? I go, hon, here's the situation. Uh, my parents are both Irish and Irish parents have a lot of kids. And then they pray that one of them marries an Italian. It's the Irish meal plan right there. Somebody knew. <laughs> that is true. That is true. My sister married an Italian guy. He's first generation. He cooks more for dinner every night than I saw K through six. That's unbelievable. <laughs> but Jerry, where were we in the 1970s? I was peckished for a whole decade. I could have used it. Could have used you. So, um, but my wife, uh, I thought she was Irish. I met my wife on the internet. How about that? Eight years ago, we met on the internet. And uh, I'm amazed we're still together because she returns everything she gets online. <laughs> I'm glad you liked that joke. So we, that's true, we met eight years ago. Now we didn't know what to tell our parents about the internet dating. It's a little weird for me. It's like a generational thing, you know? We told our parents uh, we met at the University of Phoenix. I just, uh, <laughs> but I thought she was Irish because her name is Molly. My wife's name is Molly. Sounds Irish, but she's not Irish. A uh, little curveball. I don't think we're going to have anyone in the room. My wife is Jewish. Do we have any Jewish friends here in Provo? <laughs> it's Roseanne Barr in the room. Did she come back to Utah? She's the only Jewish person in Utah I can think of. Now, my neighbor, we didn't have any Jewish families where I grew up, too, so I didn't know anything about the Jewish culture. But I'm learning, and I find with any religion or culture, there's more similarities than there are differences. There's a Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur. I remember asking my wife, I go, "Hun, how do Jewish people celebrate Yom Kippur? And she says, we don't eat. I go, that's identical to a holiday in my culture, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> but then she educated me. It turns out that's a serious holiday. I, I, I apologize. I go, what's the most festive Jewish holiday? My wife said, Christmas. <laughs> she goes, we get Chinese food and go to the movies. I go, hey, that's better than my Christmas. <laughs> oh, so things are good at home. Things are real good at home, me and my wife. You know, we pick about picking a restaurant with my wife. I don't know if it's because she's from Manhattan and there's so many, you know. She always asks me what I want. She goes, what, what do you want to eat? I go, uh, I go, let's get some Thai food. Here's my wife. No, no. I can't, I can't have Thai food today. I had Thai food yesterday. I go, oh, I go, people in Thailand handle that pretty well, you know? <laughs> now the food inside the house is getting a little more exotic too. We don't have rice, she banished rice, replaced it with quinoa. <laughs> yeah. She I was at the grocery store, she texted me to get, so I'm asking, hey, what aisle is quinoa? Where do I find it? <laughs> quinoa. I don't know if everyone's had quinoa. Quinoa's good. Quinoa's good if you put it in something that was already good. <laughs> All right. There you go. All right. 
Oh, right. <laughs> no one's ever been eating some random dish of food going, uh, this is a little bland? But I think a little quinoa would bring it out, you know? <laughs> so everything, and my wife's in charge of the food. Everything's organic too. We have organic peanut butter. Does anyone in the room have a beagle? <laughs> I have a theory, even a beagle won't eat organic peanut butter. Even a beagle, <laughs> Stuff's tough, man. If you've never had organic peanut butter, you can make it yourself. You don't need to go buy it. Here's how you make organic peanut butter. Just get out your regular peanut butter. Your regular, and then pour oil on top of it. <laughs> and then somehow remove all the peanut butter flavor. I don't know how to do that. Oh, <laughs> well, here's the final step. This is crucial, the final step. Take a $20 bill and drop that in the garbage right there. <laughs> Peter, there you go. All right. And my wife's getting a little crazy with her diet. I'm getting worried about it. She gets on the internet. She's always looking for the next trend, you know? But she doesn't challenge anything. Here's what she told me one time. She goes, hey, we're not supposed to be drinking milk as adults because we're the only species that does that. I go, hon, we're the only species that can milk cows. That's part of the puzzle. <laughs> Squirrels would love to have some ice cream from time to time. But they're undisciplined. <laughs> with a, uh, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Hey, the, milk, all right. the milk lobby has got my back right there. There we go. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sometimes I have to show us, people go, hey, you know, you take a lot of swipes at your wife during your set and she's not here to defend herself. I go, yeah, that's what we call best case scenario, everybody. That's... <laughs> I'm pretty brave when I'm out of town. <laughs> but she's always on me for something. You know what she was hounding me for, like, last year, for the whole year? She wanted me to grow a beard. She goes, you should grow a beard. I go, I don't want, I don't want to grow a beard. But you, should, you should definitely grow a beard. Which is a little backhanded. Now, you can compliment a gentleman on his existing beard. But tell someone with no beard to get one? <laughs> I know what she was saying. What she was really saying was, uh, hey, you know what could help your face? <laughs> Less of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And too much face. <laughs> I'm sweating in 4K, everybody. 4K arm. <laughs> Pixels going on right in there. <laughs> you guys are a fun crowd, man. Good crowd. So what else is going on? We live in crazy times. Hope everyone's having a good year and everything. Now, if you're wondering, I don't do political jokes. I don't really do political jokes. You know why? Because when comedians begin, they always tell us, they go, don't, don't do political jokes because only 50% of the crowd is going to like your joke, right? But then you do comedy long enough and you're like, hey, 50% is not that bad for one of my jokes. <laughs> Pretty good. But it's not 50%, because 50% don't even vote, so they don't want to hear you. Then you're splitting it again. Now you're down to 25%. That's a little, risk, a little risky. Hey, by the way, they've just came out finally nationwide with, um, for the people who don't vote, they've come out with early not voting. <laughs> so you don't have to wait till election day not to vote. <laughs> yeah. Like a month, the four weeks before the election, you go down to the Board of Election, you go, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm not voting. <laughs> You need photo ID though, they're very strict, they're very strict, very strict. Because there's been not voting fraud where people are not voting in more than one district, you know? <laughs> but here's one uh, innocuous bipartisan political joke. So we all followed the election, and it comes down to the swing states. They make it too complicated. Basically, if you win Ohio and Florida, you'll be the president, right? So I'm telling you right now, a future president is LeBron James, everybody. That guy's gonna be president, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's got Ohio wrapped up, right? And he won two titles in Florida, but maybe if he needs help with the older voters, his running mate, Jimmy Buffett. Done deal right there, done deal. <laughs> Here's a bumper sticker, the King James Buffet, right there, the King James. <laughs> so I'm a big sports fan, more than anything, I love sports. We got some Cougars fans in the room here? You guys are the 
Yeah. That was the name of my high school, so I'm gonna tell myself you're cheering for my high school. We're all happy here. That's a guy, I like cougars, good name. I don't like them when teams are tigers, right? Because, hey, we don't have tigers in North America. There's no tigers. If you're gonna be named after an animal, it should be indigenous. Really, half the teams in the country should be the deer. Everyone should just be the deer. <laughs> we got a lot of deer. That'd be a great mascot, too. Halftime in the basketball game, two people in a deer costume. We go out to center court. Out of nowhere, a Ford 150 truck. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> but here's the inspirational part. The deer get up and run away, they're fine. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Right. And the truck, the truck has $3,000 front end collision damage, and the deer went by 20. <laughs> so I'm a big sports fan. Big, big sport. We've had some good events lately. We had a good, uh, it, was, it was a good Super Bowl, very dramatic. I'm a big football. I played football in college. I don't know if you know that. Excuse, 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 I'm sorry. I played foosball in college. I played. <laughs> We had a great World Series last year. Now, I'm not from Chicago, but man, you can't beat that for drama. The Cubs, they hadn't won in 108 years. They get the World Series, it goes game seven, extra innings, and they win in a whew. I ran outside and flipped over my own car. Seemed like the right thing to do, you know? <laughs> I always watch the World Series. I love the World Series. Regular season, a little slow, you know? You ever go to a game? Any sport they hire an organ player? <laughs> to spike up the action with an organ player. <laughs> like the team owners, I'm worried if we've got some lulls. Hey, my uncle plays organ, we'll get him here. Man. <laughs> he knows everything. Da -da 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 -da. He knows that one. <laughs> you know what he closes with? Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> Baseball's got the weirdest legal problems too. Like the two biggest players of my generation, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, they both had perjury trials, right? Now, I don't know anything about the law. I, I bet we do have some legal minds in the room. My understanding of perjury trials is where they go, hey, you're on trial because last time you were on trial, you lied to us. Is that true? So I like a lot of sports that aren't as popular. I'm a tennis fan. I don't know if there's any of us left over. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful sport, tennis. Here's how they could attract more viewers. They gotta get rid of the ball boys and the ball girls and replace them with golden retrievers. <laughs> Everybody loves goldens. Goldens love tennis balls. Win, win, win. The chair umpire would be up there. Drop it, drop it. Good boy. Good boy, right? So uh, what else? And I'm a big Olympics fan now. Hey, we, we had some Winter Olympics excitement here, right in there in this town, yeah. Oh. Love the Winter Olympics. They're coming up, the Winter Olympics. They're in Korea. Um, hopefully South Korea. Have we double-checked on that? Hopefully. Oh, oh. But I get a little, I always get, I get wound up for the Winter Games because I'm from the, the, the snow belt. And then, but they got, they got sports I never saw in my whole life. The skeleton and luge and all. I go, I go, hey, if you want to represent the winner I know, put shoveling in the Winter Olympics, right? Yeah. You find the best shoveler in the world. And make the finals head to head, not against the clock, head to head. Two driveways side by side. <laughs> Little uphill. Some guy from Russia, some guy from Buffalo. Get him, buddy, go, 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 go. <laughs> Here's the thing, if you win the Olympic shoveling, you don't get a gold medal, you $20. It's $20. Tore that driveway up. You mow lawns? Yeah. yeah. Trying, to, trying to get you in the summer games. Hang in there. Summer games were great last year. The United States did great down in Rio. That was fun, man. I th here's my thing about the Olympics. They always, I love them, but they remind me of how ignorant I am, like internationally. I have no clue who other countries' flags. I'm so bad at that. I was watching the cycling. I was rooting for the guy from the Red Cross. I go, come on, buddy. You can do the like this. I told my wife, I go, hon, the medic is pulling away from everybody. Turns out he was from Switzerland. That's a guy who was from Switzerland. I, I, I thought this was gonna be the feel-good story of the world. I thought this guy's gonna win the race and deliver blood. It's unbelievable. Here's a race I want to see. The fastest man on land, Usain Bolt, there's no debate. Fastest man in water, Michael Phelps. I want to see those two race a hundred meters through a swamp. <laughs> That's 
that's one of those jokes that doesn't get 50%, but I like it, I like it. I, like it. <laughs> I watch everything on TV. I don't know if that makes me a bad fan, because you're supposed to go support your team live, but all these new arenas and stadiums, they are big jumbotrons now. That's a whole new trend, big jumbotrons. And that was very exciting until somebody invented the kiss cam. <laughs> And that's where the house camera, they just zoom in on a couple and they force you to kiss. And it scared the hell out of me and my sister at a Knicks game. <laughs> you know, that's us, Katie, you wanna piss off this crowd or go to therapy? Well, how you wanna handle it? <laughs> how you wanna do it? <laughs> so I do a lot of traveling. I had an easy trip out here, nice trip. I flew out and I like flying. I understand if people don't, but my one thing, the airlines, they don't communicate bad news. They never do that. I had a flight canceled once. They didn't even tell us. They had us all, we're at the gate, and they keep delaying the departure time. So finally, I go up to the gate attendant. I go, hey, what's going on? He goes, oh, flight's canceled. I go, oh. I go, why? He goes, but we don't have a plane. <laughs> I go, neither do I, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, the difference, I wasn't selling airfare. That's the main difference between. <laughs> now, to the airline's defense, they never say, hey, we got an airplane but their website had a lot of photographs of airplanes and like you were led to believe. I thought that was a bait and switch. I do a lot of driving, ton of driving. I think the highways are safer than ever because those rumble strips, boy, that's a good invention. Between those rumble strips and cruise control, I sleep so much better behind the <laughs> I've driven across the country. Clap if you've ever done that. Y'all have gone all the way to the coast. To me, it's more exciting going west. You drive west, you drive forever. You cross a time zone in your car heading west, right at that instant, it's an hour earlier. Woo, I get so excited. I feel like I'm from the future. <laughs> I'll burst into a restaurant and go, listen up, everybody, you're not gonna believe this. I've already seen noon today. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm from the future. <laughs> How far in the future? One hour. <laughs> I'd like to live on a time zone. That'd be cool, because a lot of times the boundary, it's a little river. Right? You end up with these two little towns facing each other across a little river. They're an hour apart. If you live there, you can go back and forth in time whenever you want it, right? You can watch Jeopardy on one side of the river, scoot to the other side, look like a genius. <laughs> yeah. The biggest perk, you can eat and then go swimming immediately. How exciting would that be? So I'm flying home tomorrow, I'll be back with the team. I like being married, it's good. I was single for a long time. That gets tough. Dating's weird. I went on a date with a, the weirdest date was a, a woman who was older than me and I knew her from high school. That was weird. Cause you remember high school, if you weren't the same grade, it was a big deal, you know? And when we met, I was a little ninth grader and she was a cafeteria lady. <laughs> And our first date, she cooked me dinner at her house. <laughs> Sloppy Joe's with tater tots, right? Yeah. Mm. And I knew she liked me when she gave me two chocolate milks, because you're only supposed to get one. <laughs> I actually want to go back to my high school cafeteria. I really do, just to, not for the food, just to, the, the efficiency was unbelievable, because I worked in restaurants at one point. My high school, they'd serve 400 kids in three minutes. <laughs> The key, regardless of the food, they served everything with an ice cream scooper. <laughs> Have your tray ready, there you go. What is a hot dog? <laughs> What's this? Corn on a cone. <laughs> I could remember that corn in high school, it wasn't even yellow, it was like translucent gray. Man. You spill your corn on the floor, you couldn't even see it anymore. Where'd my corn go? There's my goulash, I lost my corn. But the key, they had a scooper for each different food. That's what sped everything up, you know, each dedicated thing. Because that's my thing, I love ice cream, but I can't eat ice cream cones anymore because these places never have enough scoopers. I think you just have a scooper for each flavor, but they don't. Baskin Robbins, 31 different flavors, Woo. one scooper. <laughs> so after every customer, they rinse off that one scooper by dunking it in that muck bucket they got in front of you. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'll pretend that was sanitary, no problem at all. No, no problem at all. Wow. Yeah. Got a little, little tadpole on top there, there's a little tadpole. You know what, cancel the ice cream. I'm gonna gross you out and drink the bucket. Hand me that bucket. 
starting to turn this into fear factor. <laughs> oh boy, so next week I'm going to Canada. Do we have any Canadians here? You never know, any Canadians? Yeah. Oh, do you? Oh, good, good. I'll be in Montreal, that's a great city. I don't know if you're, you're like, we hate that town. We're not from the we're from the <laughs> To me, it's always intimidating going to Canada. I feel like they're very much smarter than us. I go to Montreal, every time I go to Montreal, I go, you know what, I'm gonna learn French. I'm gonna challenge myself. I'm gonna gain some culture, right? And then by day two, I'm like, well, I better probably try to learn that Celsius system before I do anything else, you know? <laughs> Because when you go to a country and you don't even know what the temperature is, you feel like a kindergartner, right? <laughs> I was in Montreal one time during the summer. The forecast is 19 degrees, right? Sounds a little nippy to an American, right? <laughs> so I asked the local guy, I go, hey, 19 degrees. I go, I go, what's that in Fahrenheit? He goes, it's real easy to convert. You take the Celsius, multiply by nine, divide by five, and then add 32. You know, it'd be even easier if he gave me the answer. That would be a lot. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know I had an algebra final today. I'll make a yes, no. Am I wearing shorts later? That's all I needed to know. <laughs> but Canadian people, very nice, super friendly. Very, very nice. Uh, even the customs people are nice because I cross the border in my car all the time. And uh, I've been searched in each direction. They're meaner coming back. I've had my car coming back. They'll they take your cell phone, they put you in this room. It takes like an hour and a half, right? I got searched going into Canada one time. The guy was apologetic. He goes, I'm so sorry. He goes, we have to search your car. Uh, you can wait inside or you can come out and watch. I go, oh, I'm gonna come watch. I wanna see you find there's stuff in here I'm looking for. <laughs> somewhere in a four pack of Nutter Butters, man. A lot, they're in here somewhere. If you find them, you get two. No, the only time I ever clowned around with an authority figure, it backfired. I was back, I was in my hometown. I saw a police car with one headlight out. I go, this would be funny. I, I'll do a little role reversal. The officer, he'll get the joke. And we'll share a big chuckle. So I flagged down his cop car. I run up to the window. I go, hey. I go, hey, you know why I pulled you over? You're missing a headlight. If you do that, make sure your car's registered. <laughs> so, all right, you guys are fun, so. Uh... Hey, I'm saving up to go to Spain, so if anyone wants to buy candy bars for me after the show, I'm selling candy bars. <laughs> I'm going to my Spanish club for my high school. I was thinking back, I go, what was the easiest money I ever made my whole life? It was selling candy bars, like Little League, Junior High stuff. I, had a, I was hooked up, man. If you did that, you probably had to go knock on doors, right? Try to sell them a candy bar. Then make a second trip to deliver the candy bar, maybe a third trip to get paid. Not me. I put the candy bars in the fridge. My brothers would eat them all. My mom would feel bad and she'd pay me. And I still haven't told her. I was eating the candy bars too, she was paying me. I was getting paid to eat candy bars. No, I got a couple of money-making ideas. Uh, I'm always thinking, I, I, how can I make a little more? I was at the dentist two weeks ago. My dentist, first of all, my dentist, I like the guy, he's a great guy. He give you mixed messages of the other stuff. He goes, hey, you need a softer toothbrush. I go, okay. And then for 20 minutes, he scrapes my teeth with metal hooks. <laughs> you need softer hooks. <laughs> but here's my money-making idea. I have, uh, my front tooth is fake. I got it knocked out playing a Little League when I was 11. So my whole adult life, fake tooth. And if anyone has fake teeth, you know, they don't stain like your natural teeth. So slowly they don't match, right? So my dentist is trying to talk me into whitening, me, whitening my natural teeth. I go, hang on, doc, I go, I'm on a budget here. I go, wouldn't it be way cheaper to stain the fake tooth? <laughs> I got 31 teeth that look the same. One is different. <laughs> and if you bought a new door for your house that didn't match, you wouldn't repaint your house, you'd repaint the door. So here's my invention. I invented coffee strips, everybody, coffee strips. <laughs> right before you go to bed, put a coffee strip right on your fake tooth. It's decaf, it won't keep you up, I thought that through. That's a $200 idea right there, folks. <laughs> Max. Oh, my dentist gives me the little uh, dental floss to go. Do you guys get hooked up with a little dental floss to go? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the heart to tell the guy. Uh, I didn't finish the one from last year, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's 
it's only three yards. I still got a yard left. I used two yards the day before because I know I'm going to the dentist. Get right in there. But here's how, here's how, I'll leave you this. Here's how I'm planning to make money. I'm writing screenplays for movies and I just want to write one big blockbuster and quit. So I'm shooting for the top. I wrote a sequel to Titanic. <laughs> Wasn't my favorite movie, but it made $2 billion worldwide. I go, let's get on this thing, right? And I know people want to see the same cast in the sequel. And I know Jack passed away at the end of the first one. That's okay. I gave Jack an identical twin brother. <laughs> Played by Leonardo DiCaprio. The twin meets Kate Winslet at Jack's funeral. They fall in love and get engaged, and for the wedding, they try to go back to England, but they take the Hindenburg. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to yeah. Yeah. Big money right there. I wrote a sequel to a movie I never even saw. It's from the same director. Uh, James Cameron did a movie called The Abyss. I never even saw it. I don't know the plot, and I wrote the sequel. Son of Abyss, right there. And then it's gonna be right there. Son, Son of Abyss. All right. But here's a new trend with movies. Used to be if a movie was a big hit, they do a sequel. Now if a movie's a big hit, they go before the original and do prequels. So I wrote two prequels, too. I wrote The Fifth Sense. It's the same kid from The Sixth Sense when he's even littler. And he only smells dead people. Thank uh, you. He's having a tough time at school. Big finale right here. Here's the prequel people want to see because they've been doing sequels for four decades with no exaggeration. So I wrote the backstory that explains it all. I wrote Rocky. Zero. <laughs> this is Rocky Balboa's first fight. This is when he learns to punch his heart, right? It's in third grade. One uppercut. Boom! He knocks out his speech therapist. How about that, everybody? Huh? There we go. Cool, you guys are the best. Thanks for coming out to Dry Bar. Thank you, buddy.